It is, uh, it is really good to be here and uh, what a special day uh, already that we've had uh, celebrating families and uh, dedications and it is a real privilege for uh, Ellie and I to be here today and to, uh, to be here as uh, uh, godparents for Corey and Des and, and Elijah and to be with you guys and so uh, we'll do what we can to support him. And I will do what I can to see that he is raised up to a different football team. <laughs> That'll certainly be part of my key criteria uh, over, this little, uh, over this little while that we, that we have. But it's also great to be here with uh, Chris and Jackie and others today as well and to see the, the dedications today. Uh, I, Ellie and I, uh, many of you know me and so I probably don't need too much of an introduction, but uh, Ellie, Ellie and I, it's really special that we're here on Family Day as well because, of course, uh, Dad, John Beasy, is my dad, and, uh, and so it's good to be back here because this is like family here uh, as, as well. Ellie and I, uh, for the last eight years, uh, we've been serving uh, out at Ross Trevor, our Baptist church, and in the last four years, uh, we serve there as our lead pastors, and so it's just a real privilege to kind of come back here. So for those of you who I, I don't know, um, I hope that I can get a chance even afterwards just to be able to say hello and get to know you as well. Well, if you have your Bibles, uh, we're going to turn uh, to Matthew 20 today. Uh, Matthew chapter 20, uh, verses 1 through to uh, 16 is where we're going to pick it up today. We're going to look at a parable of Jesus, and uh, that's where we're going to start. Parables, uh, you're, look, you're in this series throughout this year looking at Jesus is Lord. And as Lord, one of the things that Jesus spoke most uh, about what was he spoke about parables. A third of what Jesus spoke, he spoke in stories. He spoke in parables. Parables are uh, fictional stories depicting an alternative world. It's a kind of a pretty cool way to think about it. Fictional stories depicting an, etern- um, an alternative world. And one of the things with parables, a great way of understanding them, is to ask the question, and we'll look at this towards the end, is to ask the question, imagine a world like this. What Jesus is trying to open up for us is to think of a different world, to think of a kingdom world, a different way in which to live. And so we'll look at that towards the end. And so through parables, we enter into the storied world of Jesus and we see and we hear the world the way it was designed to be and then how we are called to live that out. And so let's have a read through this this parable from from Jesus. So if you have your Bible or it's on the screen or if you've got your phone, you might want to follow along because we're going to read it now and then we're going to to work our way uh, through it as we go along. It says this, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. And so they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. They said to them, he said to them, sorry, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Oh, how unfair. 
doesn't, doesn't this passage just make you, you go, this is just not right. There is something just off here. This is, this is unfair. If, if you're honest, you feel, don't you, for those first workers? You know, they're up early, the crack of dawn, they're at work at 6 o'clock, the Jewish work day went from 6 to 6, 12 hours they've worked in the heat of the day, and then some workers come in for one last measly hour of work and come payday at the end, they all walk home with the same amount. Where is the sense of fairness and justice in paying the last workers the same as the first, it just feels so wrong. So I want to come and I want to unpack this story further for us. And then we'll spend some time looking at how this story uh, calls us to live differently. And what are the implications of this story for us uh, today? Day labourers, as we read about in this passage of the first century, they were very unlikely to own any property. If you were a day labourer, you might, you might have your family and you might have a few small uh, little possessions, maybe some cooking utensils and a few different things, but you didn't own anything. You had no property, you had no shares, you had no portfolios, you didn't have a home, you didn't have anything like that. You were living essentially day to day and hand to mouth. So you would go out each day. And you would try to earn a day's wage. A day's wage was a denarius. A denarius was what was needed for you and your family for the supplies and the food for you and your family to live for one day. So each day, these day labourers would go out into the marketplace and hope that someone, a wealthy landowner, maybe a landowner who owns crops or cattle or, in this case, vineyards, would graciously give you work for a day so that you could have enough, a denarius a day, so that you could support your family and feed your family for one day. Day. That's what it's like to be a day labourer in those days. So you can imagine it, can't you? 5am, all over Judea, alarm clocks go off for these day labourers. They get up, they, they jump up out of bed and they begin to think to themselves, I hope that today will be a day that there will be a wealthy landowner who is going to be generous and gracious enough to give me a day's work so that I can support my family and feed my family for the day. So they, they jump up, they head into the shower, they do their hair. Yeah, they, 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 I've, under, I've done a little bit of research around this and discovered that they do have shares. They do their hair, they look themselves, get really nice and presentable because they know that they need to be employable. They know that they need to put out the right vibe and look presentable and respectable when they're standing there in the marketplace. So they have some brekkie, they grab their tools and they grab an espresso coffee on the way out the door and they head down to the marketplace at 6 a.m where they're ready for the landowners to come in and to then select who they're going to be hiring uh, for the day. You see, it was so important that they looked the part and were employable and trustworthy. It's kind of like a, kind of like a job interview, really, for these day labourers every morning. So 6am comes around and all the day labourers have assembled in the marketplace, hoping to be noticed by a landowner. And in the verses that we read, we read the landowner arrives. This is in verse 1 and 2. We read the landowner arrives, went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and then sent them into his vineyard. So here's these day labourers. These guys at this point in time, they are, they are grateful and they are so gen and they they are grateful because of the generosity of the landowner for a day's job because they know now these first workers that they will have what they need to support and feed their family for one day you see this is the picture that Jesus is actually painting here and it's important for us to understand something about this that as the day goes on the point that Jesus is making here is not that the landowner has so many grapes to pick that he needs to hire more people and more people and more people so that he can make a greater profit. 
The point that Jesus is trying to actually make here is that there is actually more room for people in the vineyard. There is actually more room for people to have their needs met by the landowner in the vineyard. And so in verse 3, we read the landowner goes back to the marketplace at 9am looking for more workers to meet their needs. And he sees others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And so he says to them, Look, I'm going to go out to the field, work in my vineyard, and I'll pay you whatever is right. And so off they go into the vineyard. Now, can you imagine those nine, those 6 a.m. workers, those first ones hired, what they're thinking as these, these people kind of roll in at 9 o'clock? They must be kind of thinking, well, well, there mustn't have been enough landowners for the day to employ these people. Um, and so, uh, OK, so they're, they're coming out and they're just doing a, a, little bit of a, um, a little bit of a job. They must have missed out on being employed. We then read that uh, the landowner goes out again into the marketplace at midday. And then he goes out again at 3 o'clock and he does the exact same thing. He sends more people out into the vineyard telling them that I'll pay you whatever is right. Now, these first workers at this point in time, when it hits 12 o'clock and they see, they see these new workers kind of coming in at 12 o'clock, they must be starting to think to themselves, who are these, who are these lazy people starting work at midday? Maybe they, maybe they had a late night, they, they partied too hard, they might have had a little bit too much to drink, ate a little bit too much, and they slept through their alarm clock, and they're just kind of coming in at, uh, at 12 o'clock. But then when they see the same thing happen at 3 p.m., the landowner who heads out and sends more people out, they must be thinking now, wow, we're, we're really, scratching the battle, uh, really scratching the bottom of the barrel now. What a bunch of, of riffraff, these lazy slobs, the day is nearly over and they're, and they're coming in to work at three o'clock. But then we read at 5pm in verse 6 that the landowner goes again into the marketplace and found others still standing around. This time though, the landowner questions them and says, why haven't you been working? And how do they respond? Well, they respond in verse 7, and they say, because no one has hired us, they answered. In other words, this is code for nobody wanted to employ them. See, we need to understand something about this parable, and these last group are really important in that. These last workers were the sort of people that everybody tried not to hire. Perhaps these people were people seen to be the lost causes seem to be the real, the real riffraff, the deadbeats, the ones that everyone rejected. You see, you've got to remember that these guys have been waiting there since 6am in the morning and they haven't been hired yet. But what does the landowner do? The landowner says to them still, you go and you work in my vineyard for the last hour. And they went. Then verse 8, at 6pm, the landowner instructs his foreman to call in the workers and to pay them their wages. But he says to him, here's what I want you to do. I want you to bring in, I want you to bring in the workers, pay them their wages, but I want you this time, I want you to bring those who came in last and I want you to give them their wage first. And those who came in at six o'clock who were first up, I want you to give them their pay last. So the labourers line up from the, the first from the, the first at the table, those 5 p.m. workers, you know, the, the real riffraff, the ones that are perhaps seen as the deadbeats, the one who were people over overlooked, but they were the ones who were first at the table. They line up and the landowner and they put out their hand and the landowner puts into their hand a denarius. And they they're like, my goodness, wow, I can't. You, a denarius, you've, you've got to be kidding me. And they are just so pumped to receive this denarius. They, they weren't expecting this. They, 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 this is just this is amazing. And then the rest of them who came in at five o'clock, they all line up as well. They receive their denarius and they are just pumped. But you know the other people who are pumped and excited to receive, uh, to, to, to see them receiving a denarius? That's a 6 p.m. That's a 6 a.m. workers. 
they're there, we're told in verse 10, that they're then expecting more because they've seen these guys work one measly hour and get denarius. They're sitting there going, hey, did you see what, did you see what the, the landowner gave them? He gave the denarius. If I do my mash right, we're going to walk away with at least 12 denarius today. This is going to be amazing. We can take our family on a holiday. We can do a number of the things we've always just wanted to do. We can do that. But what do we read? We read that they also received a denarius from the landowner. You can feel their pain, can't you? You can just resonate with this feeling that this is, this is unfair. Something is, something is off here. And so what do the first workers do in verse 11? They grumble. They grumble, well, hang on, hang on, landowner, wait on a minute. We've been here since the start. We've, we've worked through the heat of the day, the scorching midday sun. You can't be serious about this. This is, this is so unfair. You've made them equal to us and we've been here and slaved away all day. How does a landowner answer in verse 13, the landowner answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. He's basically saying, didn't we agree here on a denarius at the start of the day? I gave you a denarius. I supplied you what you needed. You have enough now to support your family. So go and take it. What is unfair? What is unfair about that? But again, if we are honest, there is something within us that feels there is something profoundly unfair about what happened, don't we? This parable, it has a, it has a sting to it. And Jesus knows that because it speaks right to the core of our human and our broken human condition because we all know something is unfair and, and off with this. You see, something shifted. Something shifted in the heart of those first workers. There was a transaction that happened in their heart that changed everything about the way that they viewed and the perspective that they then had of the landowner. That shift happened and they saw the landowner in a different way. Uh, a number of Christmases ago, it was, uh, it was Christmas at, at our house, at, at Ali, Ali and I. It was just a family Christmas after, after church on Christmas Day. And it was just our immediate family. There was mum and dad, there was myself, Jana, uh, Cherie, uh, Nath and partners. And then and Papa came along. I know some of you know, know Papa, but Papa uh, came along. And we weren't kind of expecting Papa to come along. He wasn't travelling so well. He, he, was, a, he was sick. And so Papa came came along and, uh, and we're sitting there about to have um, you know, our, our lunch and everything and Papa starts walking around with some white envelopes and he starts to give us, um, each of the grandkids, some white envelopes and he comes up to me and he gives me a white envelope and I open the envelope and in there uh, is a hundred dollars. And I'm like, oh, Papa, thank you so much. That's like, that's like so generous of you. I wasn't expecting that. You know, Ellie and I had put on lunch and, and everything. And so that extra, you know, 100 bucks was going to be helpful to cover off on some of the lunch. And it was unexpected. And I just thought it's really, really generous of Papa because there's four grandkids, right? And so 400 bucks for, for Papa was, was a lot around Christmas. And I was just really, really grateful uh, uh, for that. Later on that day, I, I had a conversation with my brother, Nath, and, and we were just talking about a range of different things, and I, I brought it up, and I said, oh, Nath, how, how wonderful was it, and how generous was it of Papa to give us each $100? Nath's, Nath's face became startled, and I thought, oh, no, Dan, you've put your foot in it. 
oh, Dan, uh, and I'm just trying to backpedal. I'm thinking, oh, yeah, you're probably right. Nath didn't get $100 at all. Like, I'm the eldest grandson, and then there's Jana, and then there's Cherie, and then there's Nath. Nath's probably, you know, I get 100 you know, Jana gets 75 Cherie 50 Nath gets 25 So I've kind of thought, oh, my goodness, I've, um, you know, I've just gone and blown it. I've put my foot in it here. And uh, so, and so Nath asks again, so did Papa give you, like, $100? And, and I said, yeah, he did. And he goes, yeah, but Papa gave me $200. <laughs> and at that point in time, um, you know, that grateful heart that I had and generosity towards Papa, let me tell you, it was gone. <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking, hang on, I'm the eldest grandson here. I have worked, I worked with you in the yards and the vineyards in Mujura picking grapes and everything for a, in the heat of the day in Mujura. Nath was only four at that time. What's he done to deserve double the amount that what I did? You see... Isn't it interesting how a little bit of perspective around what's happening to someone else can change our heart and our attitude towards the giver? You see, what happened for those first workers? What was it? What caused them to go from gratitude to the landowner to then grumbling at the landowner? Well, it was comparison. They got caught in the comparison trap. They became envious of others. And we see this point in verse 15. The landowner says to the workers, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money or are you envious because I am generous. You see, comparison, church, will cause the human heart to change from gratitude to grumbling in just a moment. In a moment, joy and gratitude was replaced by envy and entitlement. Had the first workers, you see, not seen what the 5 a.m. workers or the 6 a.m. workers, sorry, what the 5 p.m. workers received, they would have never felt any injustice. You see, they weren't offended by what they received, but they were offended by what was given to others. The first workers' attitude changed towards the giver once they saw what someone else was given. You know, there's been times in, in my life where I found myself caught in the comparison trap comparing my skills, my ability, my leadership capacity with the skills, ability and leadership capacity of others. And it's, it's left me grumbling at God. It's left me going, God, this is, not, this is not fair. Why has this person got this? Why has this person got that? This is not fair. Why have you only given me this? Here's the thing, though. I'm pretty sure that I'm not the only one who has found themselves caught in the comparison trap and come out emptier because of it. You see, this is something that we all wrestle with. You wrestle with it, the person sitting next to you wrestles with it, the person at the front here, the person at the back does. This is something that we all wrestle with. And I'm sure that you can think of times where you've compared yourself to others and it has robbed you of your joy and it has robbed you of gratitude. Perhaps you've looked at other families and you want what they have. And it's caused you to, to grumble at God. And it's caused you to, to feel that it's unfair that God has gifted you and gifted your family in this way, but not in that way. Perhaps you're working really hard at your job and a, and a new person comes in and this new person seems to be like the flavour of the month. They're getting all the jobs, they're getting all the attention, all the glory, and you've been working hard and slaving away at work for such a long time. And you're starting to go, well, hang on, God, what's going on here? And you start grumbling at God. You start going, this is unfair. What about, what about me? Perhaps you're comparing your spiritual gifts with other people's spiritual gifts. And you're starting to feel that your spiritual gift isn't as significant or is less significant in God's kingdom. And you're starting to complain. And you're going, God, that's just not fair. What about, what about me? Why didn't you gift me in that way? Friends, let me tell you, comparison is the thief of gratitude. 
And if you let comparison take root in your life, if you let it take root in your family, then it will cause you to become envious of others or you'll become puffed up with entitlement and superiority. You'll think that you are more deserving than other people and it will rob you of your joy and you will quickly lose sight of the goodness and the graciousness of God in your life. You'll quickly lose sight of the good things that God has put into your life and into your family and into your world. And unfortunately, the other thing is you will not be able to celebrate the successes and the, the, um, the graces and the gifts that God has put into someone else's life because you'll be too busy being envious of what God's done in them. So let me ask you today. I wonder, has comparison robbed you from the ability to see and be thankful for the grace that you've already received? Has it robbed you of the grace that your family has already received? Are you unable to see the grace and the gifts that you've already received because you are envious of the grace and the gifts that God has given to others? You see, in Ephesians 4, 1 to 3, Paul says this, he says, As a prisoner for the Lord... I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling, what? You have received. Are you running in your lane? God has got a calling on your life. He has got a graces on your life, a gift on your life. Stop looking at other people's. Stay in your lane. Are you living worthy of the calling that God has on your life? How are you going with that? Will you accept the grace and the journey that God has placed on you? And will you get out of the comparison trap? Maybe another question to help us. Where have you allowed comparison to steal your joy? You've grumbled at God and questioned whether things are fair for you. Where have you allowed that to happen? Well, can I say to us today, and here's the, here's the good news of today. God's not interested in fairness. And this is a good thing for you and me, a really, really good thing. Because if he was to treat us fairly, if he was to treat us as our sins deserved, if he was to repay us according to our iniquities, then guess what? You and I, we're in deep trouble. You see... The reality is that none of us are more deserving or entitled to God's grace than another. None of us. For we've all sinned and fallen short, yet we are all recipients of God's grace. I love what Tim Keller says. He says this. He says, the gospel is this. The gospel is this, that we are more sinful and flawed in and of ourselves than we ever dared to believe. And yet, at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus than we could ever dared hope or imagine. This is, this is the good news. This is the gospel. You see, those first workers who were employed first, they were highly favoured by the landowner. They had received grace from the landowner in the form of work that would meet their needs and the needs of their family for that day. This was just as gracious as giving wages for less work to the 5 p.m. workers. You see, we need to understand this, that the landowner, and in Jesus' parables, uh, the landowner is often representative of the Father of God and the workers of, of Israel. What we need to understand is that the landowner wasn't responding to the work that they were doing, but he was responding to the needs that they had. Every labourer received what they needed, not what they had earned. And church, the good news with this is that with God, you and I, we will not go without. He knows what we need each day. God is always more generous and always more gracious than we could ever imagine, to the point even that it frustrates us and our sense of fairness and injustice. So let us not become envious of others 
or puffed up with feelings of entitlement. But let us remember, let us remember that we have each received unreasonable generosity and amazing grace from God. Let us always give thanks to God for not paying us what we deserve, but paying us far, far better than what we can ever imagine. That is our God. That is how good He is. Have a look at Psalm 16.5. In Psalm 16.5, we read this, and I've got a different translation here, but it says, You, Lord, are all I have, and you have given me all I need. My future is in your hand. You make my lot secure. How wonderful are your gifts to me. How good they are. And in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 9, 8, we read this, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. At the beginning of today, and we're going to finish this in a moment, then we're going to worship together and I want to lead us through a time of ministry and prayer. But I started and said that parables, uh, we should think about parables as um, imagining a world like this. Let me just share with you a few things that we should imagine a world like this. This parable invites us to imagine a world where God lavishes his grace on everyone, where God is out in the marketplace looking for the people everybody else tried to ignore, welcoming them on the same terms, surprising them and everyone else with his generous grace. This parable invites us to imagine a world where people don't count how long and hard they've worked for God, nor the hours another has worked, but a world where grateful hearts serve God without thought of reward or without comparing oneself to another. This parable invites us to imagine a world where those who have laboured and served God for 40 years can walk alongside those who have only started following Jesus for 40 minutes, rejoicing all the way over the generosity and the grace of God. This parable invites us to imagine a world where people stop looking at others' gifts and graces with envy and start celebrating and living out their own. This parable invites us to imagine a world where people, when people hear of something wonderful falling into the place for another person, that they set aside that nagging, what about me feeling, and simply enjoy and celebrate with them. Isn't that beautiful? That's the world that God's looking to create. That's what the kingdom of God is meant to look like. That is how as followers of Jesus, you and I, are to live. Would you stand with me this morning? I want us to lead us in a time of, of prayer because I think there, there's some of us who are here today and, and you are feeling that you know that you're in the comparison trap and you know that it's actually, it's actually robbing you of joy. You know that it's, it's actually stealing it's stealing your joy. It's stopping you from being gracious, from gratitude. You Maybe you're here, you're bitter, you're a bit resentful, and you're envious of others and the graces that, that God has given to them. Maybe you're here, and if you're really honest with yourself, and you know what, it's, it's, good, to, it's good to be honest. You're actually angry at God, and you are grumbling at God for what He's done in other people's life, in other people's families. Or maybe you're here today and you're actually feeling more entitled and deserving of more. Or would you come and would you pray with me? If this is you today, would you just, I'm just going to pray some prayers and it's going to lead us through a time of confession. And it's my hope that just as we go through this time and also as we, as we sing, that the Lord's going to soften our heart and that we are going to be just more aware again of the goodness and the of God's grace and that we're going to live more grateful and live with more gratitude. So Spirit of God, we just welcome you into this place now. We thank you that you are here. We thank you that you are at work. And Lord, there's people of us here in this room today who your Holy Spirit has been speaking with us. And we know that we found ourselves and we're caught in the comparison trap. We're envious of others. We're not staying in our lane. We're looking out for other, at other people and all the gifts and the graces that you've given to them. And Lord, it has caused us to lose sight 
of what you've done for us, what you've done for our families. And so, Lord, right now, we just want to say I'm sorry. And so if that's you today, just where you are right now, just say, Lord, I confess I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for comparing myself with other people. I'm sorry for thinking that I'm more entitled. I'm sorry for thinking that I'm more deserving. Lord, so people are coming and they're giving their, they're confessing to you. Lord, I pray right now that you would remind each and every one of us right now of your grace to us. Would you remind us of the gifts that you have put into us? Remind us of the calling that you have called us to. And Lord, would you enable each and every person here to once again just experience a fresh touch of your spirit a fresh reminder of the goodness of Jesus, of the power of the cross, and of all that you have done for us. Lord, soften our hearts. We want to be those people. We want to be those people who live with gratitude. Live with gratitude for all that you have done. Oh, Lord, we praise you today. We want to lift you up. Thank you, Lord.